Welcome to the second installment of 6034 Fall 2020's recitations. Today is recitation number two. We'll be covering games. In other words, the adversarial search methods that we discussed in class, particularly Minimax. And in order to cover Minimax, we'll also be building up some vocabulary, roughly summarized under stat static values or what, are we, what we refer to as static values. And we'll be covering also optimizations that have been done on top of Minimax, particularly alpha beta pruning, we'll be covering more in depth and then briefly discussing two more optimizations, mainly progressive deepening and the reordering trick. Here's shortly I'll project. There you go. Here's the agenda and a visual of a shortened visual of the agenda will remain on the left side of the screen as in previous in the previous recitation. First I want to start off with an example of Minimax using tic tac toe. And if you were if you saw the lecture then this will be familiar to you, but I think reviewing it is important. So we're going to start with an empty board. And let's say that I am the I am X. And I get to start the game. If you look at the board, there are a total of nine different places where I could mark X and make a move which means that there are nine branches following from the board. So each node is representing a state of the tic-tac-toe board and each edge is a move either by X or by zero. I'm only going to draw three of them here, but just know that there are nine possible places where I could mark an X. So I'm just going to draw three random places or moves First one here at the top and then in the middle. I usually like to start in the middle, but I've never been a good tic-tac-toe player. So now I'm gonna use, I'm gonna follow the left branch. But because I already played, there are uh, the zero or O, depending on how you refer to the game, is going to make a move now. So in both of these branches, I'm going to see the X I already played, assuming it's a valid game tree. And now O is going to make two different moves, one here, or either one there or one there. And as a reminder, I'm only writing two explicitly, but if you look at the board, there are eight different empty places where the zero could have been put on, which means that there are in reality eight branches, not just two. I'll, I'll just make it a bit clearer. Whoops. I'll make it a bit clearer by adding the dots. There are eight more there. I'm gonna continue the game over here. Excuse me a second, okay. So now Continuing the two games, let's say that the left branch, after a series of moves, ends up in the following position. X, X, zero, split across. And now let's say the right branch ends up at the following state. X, X, zero, zero. I'm not a tic-tac-toe expert, so if if you see, see something a little bit odd about the way I arranged or the number of X's versus O's, don't pay too much mind to it. Again, I'm not a tic-tac-toe expert. So the, the point I want to get to with this example is if you look at this board, I am I am much closer to winning than if I were looking at the other board. Even, even if it's zero's turn and zero can successfully block me in that double X, it's still closer to winning than the right one. So I'm gonna say X is winning here, or I am winning. 
which means I'm going to assign a heuristic value and we'll discuss the vocabulary in the next slide of 55 points. I'm going to say, I'm going to say the more points a board state has, the better it is for me in this context. Now here, X seems to be losing. And if it is zero's turn, X, X really is losing because zero can just fill in the empty spot here and that'll be the end of the game. So because zero uh, X is losing, sorry, I'm going to assign a heuristic value of just five here. And th this is the basis of what we'll be doing with Minimax and the later alpha beta pruning example. There, is, there are two players, a max and a min, and each one is going to be playing in favor of its own interests and trying to move the score or the, the score of the board in their own direction. So let's formalize this a little bit. First, we have to grapple with the term static values. A static value is a numerical value assigned to each board or state. So if I go back, this h equals 55 and h equals 5, those both are static values because they are scores assigned to individual states. But I refer to them as heuristic values when I, when I drew them initially. And that's where these two branches come in. I, I sort of spoiled the joke by leaving those branches there. But one of the ways we could determine static values or one of the origins of static values is heuristic. Origins isn't the proper term. I would say one of the sources of static values is heuristic score. If you remember from my office hours video and from my recitation, I refer to heuristic score as a rule of thumb. So I'm just going to use the more proper term an estimate before throwing in the idiom rule of thumb. And in order to elaborate it a little bit more, it's a guess of how good a board state is. All right. Now for the other one. The other one is an end game score. An end game score, I'll just briefly go back to the tic-tac-toe example. Here in the H equals five, the, the game really isn't over yet. So I'm, by saying h equals 5, I'm basically saying in this context, this board, I really am in trouble here. But then let's say the game continues one more move and let's say it was actually, whoops, let's say it was actually zero's turn. Which means the game ends up like this. So this is an end game state because the game is over and the winner has been determined. So let me just label this. So that here I'm going to say that the score is, I don't know, negative 100 because I really hate losing. So an end game state is just simply 
the score when a game is over. All right, and now that we have the vocabulary out of the way, let's talk about Minimax. I began roughly summarizing what it is when I was talking through the tic-tac-toe example, but I want to make it a little bit more formal, or at least it, whoops, explicitly write out what is going on. So as I briefly alluded to earlier, in Minimax, there are two opposing players One of them wants to get the max score I'm going to leave score in parentheses and then one of them or the other one wants to get the minimum score again in parentheses oops let me correct myself the other Okay. I just wanted to write that out explicitly and now start going over through some pseudocode. Fun fact, I've had to train myself to say pseudocode, but I often will accidentally refer to it how I've all my entire life been used to refer to it as solo code. So if I if you hear me say that just um, feel free to find it amusing. Okay. Minimax is a recursive algorithm and it's very similar in implementation to depth first search, which means we're gonna make this a recursive algorithm. And we're gonna start with the base case. And the base case is you either get to a leaf node or an end game score or end game state, sorry. End game states are leaf nodes, which means you're at the bottom of the tree. Or in a game such as, say, chess, for example, where the number, the number of possible moves and how long a game is could make a tree extremely profound and extremely wide, you don't want to have to go to the very, very bottom. So we include the case where, or we include a depth limit. So how many levels down do you want to look ahead? So that's the, those are going to be our two base conditions. We either get to a leaf node or to the max depth that we've allowed. I added the underscore to make it more pseudocode like. If we get to that base case, we evaluate a score at the current state, or evaluate the score. And what this is called, this particular evaluation, we refer to it as a static evaluation. I'm going to write it in red, whoops. I always switch the highlighter accidentally. Static eval or evaluation. More on that in a couple minutes. Now we get to the recursive step. This is if the max depth limit hasn't been reached or or and I should say and we are not currently at a leaf node so if those two conditions are met we look ahead at the opponent's next move
I'm going to say that the opponent's counter move. And you'll see why. And there are two cases here. It either it's either Max turn or the Max player's turn that wants a high score. In which case, let me just write two cases. If Max Max's turn, I'm going to return. the max of the children. So I basically recurse on the children with the same operation and then return the max from there. If it's Min's turn, I apologize that the camera button is a bit in the way. I just wrote if it's Min's turn right beside it or under it. If it's Min's uh, turn, return the minimum score returned by the children by recursing there. And if 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 you're not if you're new to programming and this is a little bit daunting, don't worry. We're gonna work through an example right now. Okay, so we have a minimax tree. Things to keep in mind that are very important is note that the the player that is supposed to choose on a particular level is on the side right here and let's go through it in order i'm going to use green on green to indicate the direction that i'm shifting my attention so let's say we're at the root and this is a DFS sort of, uh, this is we're we're going in, th we're going through the nodes in DFS order. So we start at the root node where you begin the recursion on the left subtree. And again, we recurse on the left child of that and on the left child of that. And now we're at the first base case. This is a leaf node, which means we perform a static evaluation. Now the numbers are already in these boxes for your own convenience, but in reality, I want to make this a lot more accurate. In reality, it looks like this. I'm whiting it out for illustrative purposes. So you shouldn't be able to see the six anymore. What happens is you're recursing, you're recursing, you're recursing, you get to the leaf node and you detect, oh, this is a leaf node. I need to compute the static value of this node and return it up. And so depending on how you, you represent your game board, that is in the tic-tac-toe example, one example of a static evaluation that I could do is multiply the number of p the number of x's in a row by five and then subtract the number of zeros times three that that's just an example of some random static evaluation that i made up off the top of my head but it, it's some computation that takes the state of the board and gives you a score that roughly tells you how good it is or how bad it is if you wrote the function properly and if you represented the game board properly so you get to the leaf node and let me switch this back to the color it was. You get to the leaf node, you perform the static evaluation and it returns six. So now you return, whoops, there we go. So you turn six up the chain. Oh, again with the highlighter. You get six. And remember that in the pseudocode, I want the max of the children. The max because I'm at a max level. So now I need to perform, I need to continue the recursion on the right leaf node or the right child of the node where I was, where I was on. 
So the same thing, I perform some computation. Many times these computations are fairly expensive in terms of power, they take a lot of time or, ener or energy. And I get a four. I am interested only in the max, so I get a six. And now time to move on to the right subtree. Same thing. I do my static evaluation, I get an eight. Static evaluation, I get a six. I'm only interested in the max, which is an eight. But now it's min's turn, one level up. So the min, min is going to choose, as the name implies, and as in the pseudocode, the minimum of the two children. So this is going to be... Oh, the bane of my existence. It's going to be a 6. And before we determine the max's final value, we need to continue the evaluations on the right, on the right trees, or the right nodes. So... I move in this direction. I'm here. I recurse down. I know I promised I would do it in green, but I, the switching between colors is going to lead me to switch over to the highlighter again. So I'm here. I perform the static evaluation. Did you see it? I almost selected the highlighter again. So I'm at a four, then a zero. I pick the max. It's a four. And then on the other side, the two values are the same. It's a two, the min chooses the two, but at the very top, the max is interested in the largest of the two values that its uh, children provide, which is six. So we end up with a six. And if I were, if you were asked, what is the minimax path at the root node, you would say the following. This time I actually mean to use the highlighter you would say this is the minimax path because that's the path that was taken after both the max and the min players basically battled against each other down to the leaf nodes. I hope that's all clear because now we're going to <clears throat> add a bit of complexity in alpha beta optimization. So alpha, what alpha beta optimization is, is not, it's not an algorithm aside from Minimax. It's some, it's a framework that's built on top of it. It's an optimization as the title of the slide implies. And here's where I'm going to start using colors to really differentiate the different moving parts because it can get a little bit confusing and particularly for alpha beta it gets a bit counterintuitive once enough, oh, I did it again, once uh, enough variables are introduced. Okay, so here's my alpha. And alpha is going to track the ma uh, maxes or the max players best guaranteed score. and beta you probably already guessed it it's going to track the mins whoops mins best guaranteed score and really emphasis on oh, i meant i actually meant to use the highlighter that time Guaranteed. So let's briefly look at the algorithm. <laughs> First, we have to initialize. And before I say so, I want to ask you to perform the exercise of guessing what I need to eval um, initialize my alpha to. And it's a shame that I don't have an audience because generally I always ask this question and I always get the same answer. You should initialize it to zero. 
And the other answer I always get is you should initialize it to some really, really big or really negative number. The problem is doesn't that doesn't really cover all the bases. The reality is I want to initialize alpha to negative infinity. And you may have guessed already that beta is going to be initialized to infinity. And why is that? It's because the alpha's job is to make or make the score of the get the highest score possible. And so we need to if we initialize it at a, at zero, for example, and we get to a state where all the children are threes, fours, and fives, then there's really no reason to, sorry, not threes, fours, and fives, negative three, negative four, negative five, and alpha is a zero. Then there's no real reason for alpha to continue, right? So we want the most negative or the worst possible value in order to basically motivate our algorithm to per, to battle it, battle it out throughout the search tree. And what it's going to look like, I'll just label this part execution. Is as follows. Let's say this is time equals zero, so the start. And let's say this is zero, or not zero. Let's say it's some intermediate intermediate value. Let's say it's x, because I don't want to give it a fixed value at zero. So this is negative infinity. This is infinity, which means if this is infinity, beta is going to start here. And throughout the course of the game, because beta wants the minimum possible score, it's going to move downward in absolute value or in down toward the lower numbers. Alpha starts over here and it's going to move up. And this is where things start to get unintuitive because we have alpha and so far in the way I've been speaking about it, I've associated alpha to the maximizer. So you would think alpha and I've associated beta to the minimizer and you would think, oh, alpha is the maximizer, beta is the minimizer. That means alpha is the ceiling, beta is the floor. But it's the other way around. Because we're initializing beta at infinity, and we want beta to go down as much as possible, and we want alpha from negative infinity to go up as much as possible. And so what happens when they meet or when they cross? Is there anything in particular that should happen there? Well, that's the first, whoops, that's the first gold star idea for today. Is there a point where alpha is greater than or equal to beta? Let's, before I work through an example, I want to write the pseudocode for alpha beta optim optimization because I think it's, I want to make you familiar with the alpha beta optimization or the, the code, how it should work because it's a very valuable skill to be able to connect the procedural approach to when you visually see it on paper and you'll see I'll, I'll be as we work through the example i'll reference the code in key spots so that you understand where the critical points lie and where the edge cases are hence me wanting to discuss the pseudocode first okay so it's i'm going to start the function 
alpha beta. And it's going to take the following. It's going to take a game state. It's going to take alpha. It's going to take a beta. And it's going to take a depth limit. Let's say this is the max depth, but I'm going to leave it at just as in name it just depth because I'm on second thought, I, I take that back. I'm going to make it depth limit. I mean, I know I can see in the very near future that I'm going to confuse myself. Okay. So first are the base cases. If depth, depth limit, if I reach the depth limit, or uh, I'm at a leaf node. Right, I can only, if I'm at a node or at a, one of the leaf nodes or end game states, I, at that point, whether it's alpha or beta, it doesn't really matter. I just have to perform the static evaluation and return the value that I get back. Okay. Now let's go on to the max. If it's max's turn, you'll see that min, the code for min is very similar. For max, I want to basically do a recursion on each of the children. So for each child of state, I'm going to say in state to make it closer to code. I'm going to say that alpha is going to be equal to the max of itself or performing alpha beta on the child itself. I give it alpha again and beta. So I just hand off those values down to the next uh, child. And for depth, now I'm deeper one level. So it's depth minus one. Missing one parenthesis. Right? So for each of the childs, my alpha is going to become, is going to be either the max of its current value or if it sees a child that has a higher value than what it does alre uh, already, then it's just going to grab the value from the more valuable child, if you want to, uh, to phrase it one way. And now comes the gold star idea from earlier. If what happens with if alpha is greater than or equal to beta, and I think it's going to be harder for me to explain as I'm writing code, or it's harder, for, it's harder to visualize what's really going on when you're only looking at code. But I'll, I'll make this point very clear when I'm working with the graph. But just briefly, let me finish writing this, I'm going to break out of there. And why would I break is so this is an adversarial search let's say it's only two leaves at the top I have max and then min is next in the earlier example I had a value of six whoops I had a value of six here and I'm trying to think, uh, I'm trying to give you the example while giving away what's coming after. Notice how min skipped eight. Assume we were looping through these and then suddenly we broke out of the loop because 
because suddenly there was no reason for Min to be there. I I know it's very cryptic, but I, I, I'm basically giving away the punchline. I'm going to work through the example and hopefully it's going to become very clear. So I'm going to break out of the loop when that condition is met and I'm going to return alpha. I'm the I'm going to do the min now, but I'm going to do it on the on a separate page because space is not permitting. But it's very very similar to alpha. Let me just briefly make sure that I didn't write anything. Ah, we call this pruning. That's what I was missing. Okay, so on to the min. If it's the minimizer's turn, I'll display this code later when we're working through the alpha beta example. For each child, in state beta is equal to the min of much much as we did with alpha is the min of itself or what you get when you perform alpha beta on the child and you pass down alpha beta and a depth minus one because you're one level deeper okay and we include the same condition here if alpha i'm going to invert it just because it's beta or we're in if min if beta is greater than or equal to alpha, we break. And again, that's pruning. And we return beta. Okay. So now that that's out of the way, let's work through a alpha beta example. I promised that I would display the code at the same time. I have the code written in a separate slide. So I, I'm going to switch the view such that everything, let's see, nope, there we go such that everything is in view. This is a separate slide I put where I prepared so that all the code is visible in one place. Okay. So let's start from the top. Much how we did earlier. I'm going to use blue to indicate no, never mind, I'm going to use black just in case there's anyone that can't use, uh, can't see blue or has trouble seeing. I'm hoping that black doesn't interfere too much with the edge drawings. I'll make it, I'll try to make it as clear as possible. So let's start at the top. Actually, I don't even start with black. Remember that the first step is the initialization. And one habit that I've developed or one technique that makes things a little bit clearer is to look at what I'm updating. First, I'm updating max, which means the alpha is the one that's going to change throughout the course of this evaluating on this level. So I'm going to write alpha at the bottom. Alpha is equal to negative infinity, the initialization step, beta is equal to infinity. And now I go down one level because remember, Let's see how good I'm pointing on the other device. There we go. Remember that we're recursing on each child. Make 
excuse me for one second. Okay. We're recursing on each child. Now we're updating beta on this level. So I'm going to write beta at the bottom, alpha at the top. Alpha is equal to negative infinity. Beta is equal to infinity. And again, in DFS fashion and how we did with the mini max example at the very beginning of the recitation, I'm going to recurse one more time. And this time I'm updating alpha. So beta is at the top, alpha is the bottom. And now when I go down, even though the values are passed down to the leaf nodes, remember that in our base case, we don't really use the static values or we use the static values, sorry. We don't use alpha or beta, so I'm not gonna rewrite them. It's also redundant, it's gonna get very cluttered. I'm just going to say that, I'm gonna signal that the value, I performed the static evaluation and it was given up, or it was returned to the level up, which means here, the line is alpha is the max of itself. Right now it's, negative infinity or the alpha beta value of let me try to point two places at the same time or the alpha beta value of this child this child being six so six is being returned which means it's the alpha it's the max of either negative infinity or six in our lingo i'm going to write alpha is greater than or equal to six and the reason I write that is because we're in the middle of a loop, right? I just assigned six, but the next iteration is going to be alpha is going to be equal to the max of six or in this case, four. Oh, it had been so long since I accidentally used the highlighter. So let me strike this out because I just evaluated the six and I evaluate the four and obviously six is greater than four. So instead of alpha is greater than or equal to six, alpha is equal to six. And if you remember from our example at the beginning of the recitation, that is the value that we gave this node. So, so far so good. Now we have a six and let's look back at the pseudocode or let's look at both. So now I'm here, it's a min level. So I'm look at, looking at min, beta right now is infinity. It's the minimum of infinity or this first child. I noticed I truncated it a little bit because it was hard to fit all everything into the, into the small screen, but it right now it's the min of the alpha beta of the child, which is this tree I just did is six. So the min between infinity and six is obviously six. But now let me just rewrite it. Less than or equal to six. But remember it's min and we're still executing obviously. So for the alpha example, because we were still in the loop, I did the greater than or equal to beta is always going to go down. It's always minimum. So six is basically the biggest value that it's going to get at any point, right? Anything that comes afterward or anything, whoops, let's say I don't know anything about this tree. No matter what comes in this tree, I know that the score, at least from the perspective of the minimizer, is never going to get any worse than six. It's only going to go down from, as in down being better for the min. It's only going to get better for the min from there. Pardon me though, my allergies are starting to get, get to me. Okay. So now we have six. Let's move to the, 
Whoops. Let's move to the next subtree. Remember that the alpha beta values are passed down because it's the min, in this case, the min of it itself or another one. Let's see, this is going to be, because it's max, max is the one that's being updated. So beta is greater than or equal to six, or whoops, not greater than or equal to, less than or equal to six, because beta passed it down. And this is an important detail. Remember that here, when I evaluated this, this gave me a, a value of six. And when it gave me a value of six, beta was the one that caught it, right? Here, alpha is negative infinity, beta is infinity, but it's a minimizer level. So the relevant instruction that we were running at the time is min, we only updated beta. So alpha is still negative infinity, which means that the value that we're going to use here is alpha is equal to negative infinity again, because beta was the one that caught the alpha is equal to six from the other subtree, from the left one. And now we do the same operation we did earlier. Alpha is greater than or equal to eight. Do you see something weird there? Let me use a familiar color code and symbol to try to jog some memories. So let's look at this. Beta is less than or equal to six. Alpha is greater than or equal to eight. Does it remind you of this? Hopefully. So right now we have the all important condition. Alpha is greater than or equal to beta. So what's happening here in reality? So we, we handed down the, the beta value, right from here we have that beta six, beta six, and we started with negative infinity. The first round, when we recursed, it was between negative infinity and eight, and alpha obviously becomes eight, that's the max. Alpha is greater, eight is greater than six. So why why does this happen? So what this, what this means is, in this case, intuitively, alpha a maximizer has already gotten a value of eight right which means nothing that comes afterward is going to make it any worse it's only going to get better than eight but the minimizer is trying to minimize right it's going to get it's trying to get the smallest possible score and it already guarantees a score of six So here, beta already knows that by taking this, this path, it's, a, it's guaranteed a value of six. So it, why would it ever take this path when it knows it's going to be much, much worse? As in, it, it doesn't need to evaluate the rest of this to know that it's going to be worse just because alpha already is greater than beta here. So what happens is, this will never get evaluated. Oh, there we go. This never gets evaluated because there's no reason to, comp to make that computation. And this gets pruned. This is the prune that I wrote earlier. And if we look at what happens in code, what, it, what, the, what is really happening is, so alpha is greater than beta. I break, but alpha is still eight. I return eight. 
and when I return 8, whoops, let me, give me two seconds to, th uh, to stare at this. Yep. Pardon me. I, I, it gets the, I admit that the watching all the lines and squiggles gets really overwhelming, even for me. And I've been, I've been staring at it for uh, learning the material for a while. So I think it's, it's best to take it calmly and look at it many times over until it really kicks in. So yes, it returns eight. I chose eight. 8 is greater than 6, return 8. What is going to happen is basically you have to, we have to go back to this example. So this subtree, remember that we were executing it as part of this call. And before we started executing it, remember that beta was infinity, then it became 6 when we ran this and now in this in this iteration beta is choosing between six or eight from from this eight because we remember we we pruned we broke uh, we broke the loop so this never gets evaluated we just return this we don't care we don't care what comes afterward so we return eight, making beta the minimum of either six or eight. So what I'm going to say in this case is I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say officially beta is equal to eight because in reality we didn't, this node, and this is important to note, this node never got realized. I didn't, in order to compute the value of that node, I would need the static evaluation of this node and this node. But that never happened, we cut it short. So technically, if I were to ask you which leaf nodes were pruned, this leaf node was pruned, which decision node was pruned, this is the decision node, and it was never fully realized because we cut this computation short, so this was pruned. But I'm gonna say that this is eight. And I'm gonna write it in black just to Ah, oh. in eight, just to emphasize that we're choosing between six and eight, and we know that the minimizer is always going to go to eight. I mean, not the minimizer is going to go to six between the two. So after the brief lapsus mentis, beta is equal to six because it chose the left child. And now popping up the stack, alpha is gonna be equal to the max of negative infinity or the beta that we're getting from the left, the left child, which is six, which means we cross this out, alpha is greater than or equal to six. Because again, it's the maximizer, so it's always going to go up. The, the worst that it can ever get is six. Now we continue, we start going down the stack. We're in the min, so I'm gonna write alpha at the top, greater than or equal to six. Reminder that we're in the second iteration of this. So I'm, now I'm choosing between the, ma the a max of six or whatever comes out of, uh, of this. Beta is equal to infinity because remember that the beta that we got from the beta that we got from this tree 
went to the alpha. And so we're in this tree, we're getting the, the original beta at the very top, right? The, this beta goes to alpha and this, the beta that was already on originally at infinity is the one that's handed, handed down. Okay, moving down one level, alpha is the one that gets updated now. So it's going to be written at the bottom, beta's at the top. Ugh. Alpha is greater than or equal to six. Okay. We've handed down alpha all the way down the stack and now we're evaluating the different nodes. So I evaluate the four so alpha is going to be the max of either six that it got from the very top root node or four. It's going to take, it's going to stay at six alpha is greater than or equal to six. And then the same is going to happen with the zero alpha is greater than or equal to six. Okay. Now what's going to happen? Let's look again at the code. So we're going up one level from max, which means we executed the max from this statement right here. Oops. From uh, beta is gonna receive the value that we just got from here. Technically we handed it down, but it never, it never changed because alpha didn't find a value that it didn't already have at the top, as in, the, it basically kept the value from up here all the way down here because it didn't find anything better. And now we're handing it back up to beta over here, which means beta is the minimum. Beta is going to be the, the minimum of infinity, which is what we were giving it also here and six, which is what we're getting back from alpha because alpha didn't find anything better. So let me write it a little bit more explicitly. Now, beta is less than or equal to six. Does it look familiar again? So now we are again at the prune condition. Pardon me. Beta is Oops. Less than or equal to alpha. And now this is what's going this is a what we call a deep cut or deep prune. And the reason it's deep, it's because the alpha beta value or the alpha value that caused the prune was an alpha value that was received from the root node. So it wasn't a direct consequence of the leaf nodes down here. It, it's a consequence of the alpha value two levels up from, you could say the grandparent of the children. And so that, that's a deep cut. And what's going to happen is this entire subtree never gets evaluated. And again, we can think about it in terms of intuitively what really is happening. And what's happening is, let's see, at this node from this tree, because it didn't, because alpha didn't find anything better and it already has a guarantee at the top, alpha returned six and beta grabbed it, which means no matter what comes from this other tree, whatever comes the the expected outcome that max at the very top is going to get at least from this tree is never going to be better it's only it's either going to be the same as what it already has guaranteed from this tree or it's going to be worse because you i mean you you can already see it from here you would get that beta is equal to two and we would set beta beta equal to two here 
and the maximizer would never choose this path when it has something much better over here so we may as well completely skip this entire subtree and save ourselves the computation so this is never evaluated neither this nor this and this decision node is never realized because we didn't evaluate the full subtree under it so let me just highlight it a little bit more this is pruned this is pruned this one is also pruned I, I typically we don't mark the decision nodes that we prune but just for the illustration I marked it there and then this one its values never realized so ten, if I were to ask you which nodes were pruned you would also include this one in the list okay And because we're pruning, remember that we return the value that we have at the moment. So beta is six. We return that. Let me make it more explicit. We return six. Alpha is greater than or equal to six. Not anymore. Alpha is equal to six. And that's because of the left subtree. And that is the essence of um, alpha beta pruning. I've, I tried to be as thorough and as cautious as possible. I even, I gave myself a pause because I wanted to make absolutely certain that I wouldn't, you know, mess up the algorithm. I, you know, if, if it was a little bit slow for you, I, I apologize. It's in, in the interest of thoroughness and correctness that I wanted to mechanically go through this so methodically as well and intuitive, intuitively. Okay, so I only have, you know, uh, relatively quick topics to cover. This was the hardest part of the recitation today. So alpha, in this case, what alpha beta pruning did was pretty ideal. We didn't evaluate one, two, three leaf nodes and one, two, three decision nodes we completely skipped them. Let me, whoops, that's a blooper. There we go. We completely skipped a few evaluations and that really saves a lot of time, especially if it's a complicated or deep game tree. But sometimes it's not that ideal. So let's look at the following example. Let's say that the, st the values at the leaf nodes are 4, 5, 3, 2, 8, 9, 7, and 6. So what is going to happen? I, I, the, the recitation is already getting a little bit long, so I'm not going to go through the whole alpha beta example. I encourage you to try doing alpha beta pruning on this particular example on your own time. But what's going to happen or what you should see happens is let's look at the max here. The max is going to be a five. So the min is going to be less than or equal to five. And you want to check the other branch and you see the three and the min thinks, okay, it's a three, which means it's already better than what I had over here. Perhaps it could get better if I explore even further and it explores the two. So min ends up being, well, the the three goes here. It, it, and min ends up being three. And uh, so max is gonna be greater than or equal to three. It goes, uh, you come down, you come down. So max here, as in the previous example, it's going to be greater than or equal to three, greater than or equal to eight, greater than or equal to nine, max settles on nine. Okay, so the min is going to be less than or equal to nine. I know this is fast. This is why I am, I encourage you to try it on your own time. Min is less than or equal to nine. We go back down here. Max is going to be greater than or equal to, remember that at the root node, it was three. So comparing the max of seven and three, it's going to be seven. It stays at seven. 
and seven is still better than eight and nine over here so min is gonna take it anyway and what is going to end up happening and what you notice if you try this on your own time is this is going to be the minimax the, the minimax path you see why so what's what ends up happening is all the leaf nodes are statically evaluated eventually so minimax with alpha beta pruning yields the same number of operations as minimax by itself so any benefit of the alpha beta pruning complexity is lost and now let's look at another one where alpha beta pruning does yield a very big benefit let's see Six, seven, nine, eight, two, three, five, four. What do you notice from in, in between this one and this one? In this case, and this being the worst case, all the best values were to the right. And what I mean by that is whenever with the exception of the leaf nodes the leaf nodes are relatively interchangeable because we don't really do any alpha or beta there we just return the value at the leaf node but let's say here at this min the best value for the min was this right subtree not the left one the following tree is a mirror image of the previous one Let's look at the min here. Here, the min, the best value for it is no longer the right subtree, it's the left one. And let's think about a little bit what happens then. Let's just ignore the rest of the tree. Let's just focus on this one. So when it comes here, the max is gonna choose either two or three, it's gonna choose three. Min is gonna be less than or equal to three then the max is going to be greater than or equal to five and then the min is going to prune because already it's, it knows it's going to be less than or equal to three and you know it, there's no reason in exploring this because max is going to be greater than or equal to five you have the prune condition so you've already cut operations here and the same thing is going to happen here you get the min you, the min is going to be less than or equal to six i mean to seven sorry to seven because the max chooses a seven and then it's the max is going to be greater than or equal to nine on this one and the min is going to say i'm already less than or equal to seven why would i keep exploring if the max is already is is trending above nine so this is pruned and so the general trend that i want to make you see is in the ideal case or the ideal scenario for alpha beta pruning let me highlight it to make it a little bit more explicit the best the best nodes for the <clears throat> for the the given player are to the left so if it's a min the lowest values are the left children if it's a max, the highest values are the left children. That's the ideal one, because once you get that better value on the left, it's because we're doing depth first search on the left subtree first, then we get to that best value and we quickly realize when moving on to the other children of the tree, well, this isn't good and we, and we can quickly start pruning. And that is the basis of progressive deepening in particular the reordering trick but let's talk a little bit about progressive deepening very briefly and then i'll cover the reordering trick which is which is used in such arrangements in, as this one and the previous one but let's get through progressive deepening first uh, this is the last of the material that i have to cover for today 
So don't despair that this is getting longer. If you if you're able to attend the recitation, I encourage you to go there and ask the TAs in person so that you may interact with the material on you know a person to person basis. Okay, um, shameless pubbing aside, we call progressive deepening an any time algorithm. And the reason we do is, I'll explain here, we first evaluate and in parentheses, this is actually a, by evaluate, I mean minimax with alpha beta pruning. I'm just going to say alpha beta to depth one then depth two then depth three depth four you name it until whoops you run out of time So what does that mean? Remember that the premise that we started with, with in the distinction between end game states and heuristic scores is that you're never, not never, you might not always be able to get to the end game states. And let's say it's a chess, you're playing against the chess machine and there's a time limit in between by when you should make a move. The machine isn't going to have time to calculate the entire expansive set of trees for, based on the move that you just made and then make a move. Maybe in, if Moore's Law carries us for a few more years, then maybe we will. <clears throat> or maybe we already can, but I digress. So the point is you won't always get to the very bottom of the tree. There's There has to be a point at which you stop. And the way progressive deepening makes it is first you evaluate this tree and then you evaluate one level deeper and then one level deeper and one level deeper until you run out of time and what we refer what makes it an any time algorithm is because you're you're using heuristic scores the alpha beta the minimax with alpha beta pruning is going to give you the best minimax path according to the the heuristic scores and whenever you run out of time the minimax path that you have found at the depth that you found is going to be the optimal one so at any time the algorithm stops hence the name you get an optimal minimax path in this in this context of adversarial search with progressive deepening that's why we call it a minimax um, an anytime algorithm and the gold star idea here is that you incorporate DFS into a BFS framework so recall from lecture that we refer to BFS the following way. BFS explores by level. You first explore this level, then you explore this level, then you explore this level. And that's exactly what is happening here. This is a depth zero, depth one, depth two, so on and so forth. So we're taking minimax with alpha beta pruning, which is inherently a DFS operation, and we're piecing it into this BFS framework from the progressive deepening. And this combination is what um, gives us the optimal solution for the, given, the allotted time. And now finally, last but not least, the reordering trick. And this is very, very convenient when incorporated into 
a progressive deepening framework. And what it does is, after each level of progressive deepening, move the best node to the left. You remember when we discussed the optimal versus worst case scenario for alpha beta pruning? So this is precisely what we're what I was starting to allude to, that regardless of whether it's min or max, the the node that the the player would choose, you just move it to be the leftmost child. So let's say I have this tree nodes A and B, and this is max. I have a value of one, I have a value of two. So, well, this is, to clarify, this is depth zero. So depth one is the first children. Let's say, so because this is a max, I know the max is going to prefer B. So after I perform progressive deepening at depth one, I perform the reordering and then I move on to depth two. And at depth two, it's going to look like this. So now this is B and this is A. Let's say this is F, G, H, I, five, four, two. And now this is a four because Let's say at the first, the, when at depth one, you don't really, you had to rely on some heuristic function to get you that this is two and that this is one. And now that you've added, so we reordered it, which is why this B is on the leftmost child. Now that we go deeper, we have more information. So our estimate of how good B is, is updated. So it, B was a more promising path than A, and what's happened is it's even more promising, at least in the eyes of the maximizer. The same has happened with A. And if we can go even, even deeper. So in this case, when we move on to depth three, because, G, because this is a min, let me write that down. Because this middle level is a min, this now becomes the best child and I'm going to make this the leftmost child. So I, I would swap it with the F and that would be for depth three. And very, very, very important when you're reordering, you have to preserve which you have to preserve the connections between the nodes. So if you, let's say you're reordering a tree and let's say B, F and G, let's say, you suddenly connect B to H and I and A to F and G just to reorder, then that's no longer the same tree. Um, you the, the nodes all have to stay connected to their parent and corresponding children for in order for a reordering to work. You just have to swap their order, i.e. which one comes first from left to right. Okay. So thank you for sticking through. That's the extent of the material that I wanted to cover for today. 
if you have any questions, thoughts, concerns, feel free to reach out on Piazza in Office Hours, and I'll see you on the next one.